Welcome back. This is the Ben Shapiro Show. Joining us on the line is Representative Dan Crenshaw. He's representative for Texas' second congressional district. He's also host of the podcast, Hold These Truths, and author of Fortitude, American Resilience in Our Era of Outrage. Of course, he served in Afghanistan and then, of course, lost an eye being hit by an IED on a deployment over there, served 10 years in the Navy SEALs. Dan, thanks so much for joining the show. Good to talk to you. Dan, always great to be with you. So, Dan, obviously, this is one of the darkest weeks in modern American foreign policy history. Certainly of my lifetime, I was born in the 80s, so I don't remember the fall of Saigon, but the utter betrayal to which the Biden administration has now subjected our allies in Afghanistan and also the complete surrender of the entire country to the Taliban with now apparently no true ability to even do anti-terror operations in the country. It's astonishing how badly this was handled. It, it really is. Um, I think we're forgetting something to it. It's also a surrender of a, of a basic strategic deterrence. You know, the reason we go into Afghanistan, the reason we kept deploying there, this is something the American people need to hear that they have not heard for years. But the reason we keep going there is to prevent the terrorist safe haven, because that terrorist safe haven is what caused 9-11. So our goal was yeah, not just to go after the people who did it, but to prevent it from ever happening again. You know, we're forward deployed everywhere around the world. And yet, for some reason, the No More Endless Wars crowd has, has singularly focused on Afghanistan. And people cannot seem to distinguish between nation building, which indeed is a waste in a place like Afghanistan, but they can't distinguish between that and a small residual force that was basically keeping a stalemate, propping up the Afghan government enough so that we don't see this kind of terrorist safe haven take place. And it, it's, it's really astonishing that we're in this position, but there's been bipartisan bad decisions on this for a long time. You know, a push by conservatives as well, the no more endless wars crowd. Who, who deny the reality of, of where, we're, where we're at. I mean, look, the reality is it's either this outcome or a small residual force. And they never wanted to believe that. They always wanted to believe in this fictional reality where you could have it both ways, with zero troop presence and also a, a stable enough Afghanistan where no terrorist safe havens are. But it's not true. Never has. Yeah, Dan, this is the part that, that drives me up an absolute wall. So we have heard, I mean, Joe Biden just lied overtly yesterday. He kept saying over and over, we'd have rows of headstones at Arlington National Cemetery that uh, are we going to send another generation over there to die. The United States has had a minimum troop presence in Afghanistan since 2014 when NATO shifted its mission. We had 2,500 yep. troops in Afghanistan. We'd had zero combat casualties since February 2020. There is no way to overstate this. I mean, the, the, the fact that he was treating this as, quote unquote, endless war, when we had stopped spending hundreds of billions of dollars, we were now spending about $45 billion a year to have a minimum troop presence there and to prop up the Afghan government. And then that we were working in close tandem with the Afghan military, which was, in fact, incurring serious casualties. Like Joe Biden ripping on the Afghan military to the tune of these are all cowards who ran away, when it's perfectly obvious what happened here. The Afghan military underwent 55,000 deaths over the last seven years. And the United States military underwent under 100 deaths over the last seven years. In, in the way of combat here. And yet the idea here from Joe Biden is that the best possible policy here was to withdraw all of the bases of support upon which the Afghan military was relying. We removed all air support. We took away all of the civilian contractors who were even fixing their planes. And so is it any wonder that the Afghan military collapsed overnight? No, and this is a great point to bring up. Look, yet they have sacrificed, but I fought with these people. But I'll never forget this story. Uh, we did a mission uh, back when I was deployed there. And this was a simpler mission than we normally did. Usually we flew in by helicopter to insert, but this time we drove. And we drove our MRAPs and they drove their Humvees and we went and did our thing. And, and, and we're talking about it afterwards. We said, you know, you guys have to be able to do this on your own one day. And they asked us a very simple question. They said, would you go do it with the trucks that we have? Would you go do this? And we had to answer honestly, <laughs> nope, no, we would not. Because it's too dangerous to do it in your trucks. They're not as well armored as ours. So, okay, I get the point. And the point is, with a minimal backup, with, with minimal assistance, the Afghan army could continue that stalemate with the Taliban, which, is, as far as strategic national security interests are concerned, that's what America wants. Okay, we, we, what we want is to deny a terrorist safe haven. I can't say that enough. And it, it was never told to the American people that way. And that's really unfortunate. And what we've done is basically told a, a, a drowning man to learn how to swim while we pull away his life raft. You know what? It, 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 it's not actually a fair fight between the Afghan army and the Taliban. The Taliban are an insurgency. They play by no rules. They'll kill civilians. They'll hide amongst civilians. It, it's a completely different way of warfare. It's not like they're fighting a conventional force. 
And so it, it really is insulting to them to, to, to have expected this. Um, it, it's also that they're a brand new country. We keep saying, oh, we spent all this money and, and 20 years of training. How come they're not just like Navy SEALs? Well, they aren't. I mean, they don't have the foundations. They don't have cultural foundations of warfare. They don't have, you know, sure, it's a warrior culture in a sense, but not in a traditional sense at all. Not the way that Americans have. They don't have the logistical foundations and they, they don't have a way to pay their, their soldiers. This is what we were taking care of. And again, at, at fairly minimal cost, while, while also providing a, a strategic national, national interest. I mean, look, just a few days ago, we had the ability to have bases and aircraft to stations a few hundred miles away from China and Iran. You think this is important? This is important stuff, uh, while also, again, denying a terrorist safe haven. Between Representative Dan Crenshaw, who, of course, served in Afghanistan with the Navy SEALs. So, Dan, you know, the, the, this is a bigger point that you're making here, which is the geostrategic points. There's the tactical point here, which is this is a complete failure. We ended up giving billions of dollars in equipment to literally the worst people on Earth. Uh, but then there's the geostrategic point, and that is that American foreign policy is reliant on two basic mainstays. One, that we are a good ally, and two, that we are a horrifically bad enemy. That if you cross us, we will break you, and if you ally with us, we will defend you. And we have, in, a, in one stroke, basically undermined both of those. We have now abandoned tens of thousands of our allies in Afghanistan. Hell, we've abandoned 10,000 Americans in Afghanistan at this point without any plan to get them out. And at the same time, we have now conveyed to the rest of the world that if we choose, we'll just pull out and leave you to die at a moment's notice. I mean, we've already done this to the Kurds. We've already done this to the people of Hong Kong and the West has more, more broadly. We've already done this to the people of Iran, the people of Cuba. Like, how many more allies is the United States going to betray before a bunch of people start saying, okay, well, maybe we're just going to have to, you know, be conciliatory with America's enemies. China knows this. Russia knows this. Iran knows this, which is why they are all on the march right now. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's extremely disappointing for American prestige. It's extremely damaging. Um, the potential future alliances that we may need to um, may, may need to establish. You know, and, and there's this, there's a bit of a mythology out there that, especially from the No More Endless Wars crowd, that you know, we're, we're, we're not mad that Biden pulled out. We're, we're mad at how he did it. We, you know, we would have done it differently. Well, I would say how exactly. I mean, so there's certainly improvements here. I mean, uh, what the Biden administration could have done much differently was at least protect American citizens and get them out first in a more orderly fashion. The U.S. ambassador to, in Kabul needs to be fired and resigned in shame. You know, he actually requested to be pulled out uh, before embassy staff had, had even left. He wanted to abandon his post. Secretary of State needs to needs to resign um, based on these actions as well. So, you know, there's there are some improvements there, but but let me be very clear about something. If your goal was to go to zero troops, this was going to happen. Now, it happened faster than we thought, but it was always going to happen. And that strategic deterrence, that strategic national interest that we have, was always going to end up like this if you went to zero troops. And like you said earlier, our cost was minimal. There is a difference between nation building and a residual security force. Our cost was minimal. We had very few troops there, providing the backup the Afghan government needed, and at a very low cost to us in both lives and money. And um, it's to throw that all away, basically for the sake of an emotional slogan, bring the troops home, right? Because it makes us feel good. Well, facts don't care about your feelings, Ben, as you know. <laughs> and uh, this is exactly a, a good case study for that. Yeah, Dan, one of the things that we've seen immediately is China recognizing the Taliban. Uh, they want to go into the rare earths metals business with the Taliban. Uh, meanwhile, they're openly threatening Taiwan at this point. I mean, they, they held a joint military exercise uh, on the outskirts of Taiwan. They're already having their, their newspapers uh, print out, put out threats about Taiwan. And if you're Taiwan at this point, you got to be thinking, like, what if China moves on us? Are we going to see something similar to what we saw in Hong Kong with Taiwan, where the Taiwanese people say, well, maybe the best move we can make here is to elect some sort of government that is friendlier to the Chinese government to try and reach some sort of rapprochement rather than relying on the United States for backup. Because again, the United States has not been a reliable partner here, whether we are talking about the United States standing by while the, while the Russians invaded Crimea, or whether we're talking about the takeover of Hong Kong, or now whether we're talking about the complete Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, the Taiwan situation is very precarious. And I'm deeply worried that the Chinese are going to test fight it on this one. Um, but, but look, uh, Americans need to have some introspection here. We need to decide who we want to be. Are we, are, we, are we the leaders of the world or not? And no, that doesn't mean world police. But it is an honest assessment of what defense and national security actually mean. 
it, it seems to me that there's a lot of people, and again, I'm going to pin this right back of the No More Endless Wars crowd. It seems to me that they think that national defense means like lining up Navy SEALs along our beaches in California, um, <laughs> surrounding our shorelines with Navy ships and, and just waiting for the enemy to come, you know, looking out over the horizon with binoculars, defending the country. That's not actually how it works in the real world. In the real world, you need forward deployed presence. You need to build alliances. And those alliances have to be established and reassuring and, and consistent. And if you don't have, and yes, there's a cost to that, but there's also quite an enormous benefit. And I, I, I don't know where we went wrong on this. Um, I, 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 I think the American public is, I think the, the pendulum has swung so far in the wrong direction because we were rightfully sick of, I think the wasteful nation building that occurred in Afghanistan, but we have to get back to, I think, a, a sense of normal and stop looking at foreign policy with pure emotion and look at it with realism. Again, a lot of people say, well, well, it was, it was a pointless war. It wasn't, wasn't going anywhere. Look at the Soviets, look at the British, all the same thing. And I think, okay, that, that's fine. But the, but your, the premise of your argument seems to be that, well, I wish I lived in a different reality, but I have to live in the real world. And especially with some responsibility as a policymaker, we have to live in the real world. And in the real world, there was always two options here, uh, this outcome or a small residual force. And anybody who denies that is lying to themselves. And Dan, it really is a devastating day for American prestige around the world. Again, uh, we, we are not a good ally to our allies at this point. We are, we are apparently not a particularly formidable enemy to a lot of our enemies. And the image uh, that is now rocking around the world of a bunch of 8th century barbarians uh, storming the American embassy, which we built at the cost of some $700 million, uh, is, uh, is going to be taken up by terrorists around the world. There, there are already stories that they are doing just that. Uh, it, is, it is perfectly predictable. It is really, really ugly. Um, but it is it is not at all surprising. The only thing surprising here is that anybody thought it would end differently, including apparently the president of the United States. It's Representative Dan Crenshaw of Texas. Appreciate your time on what is a, a very dark week for the United States, sir.